Why, yes, Virginia, returning to work at the office isn't working for people, and here's why. Hey everyone, this is Kevin the Entrepreneur, and this is a little bit of a follow-up to my video yesterday about how employers just do not understand where they are failing with remote work and forcing people to come back into the office. And you know, one of the reasons that article just lit a fire under my butt is because I'm reading all these articles from these big, serious news publications, you know, the New York Times and Fast Company and Inc. where it's like, oh, see, remote work isn't working. The employers know it. The big bosses, they know what they're d doing. And the problem I have with these articles is that, well, I don't want to, like, you know, just reject all of this completely out of hand. I'm sure there are some small advantages to being in the office. I think the last few years have proven without a shadow of a doubt that remote work is here. It should be here to stay. And basically, all they're doing is creating a huge headache by not embracing it more. Now look, there's some situations, as I mentioned, where maybe being in the office is probably a good thing. But here's the thing, for those who say like you get more creativity when you're in the office, if Pixar can make Turning Red, Luca, and Soul out of their own homes remotely, then I think an accountant can do his job over Google Drive. But here's the thing, it's not, I was kind of really just kind of focusing on how the uh, big publications were basically trying to push the narrative that we need to go back to the office and delaying going back to the office is going to cause a problem and it clearly will not. Well, Vox, or at least this particular writer from Vox, has a different opinion. Now, I have never been the biggest fan of Vox, but once in a while they do hit out of the park and I think this is a kind of interesting because Vox is for better or worse, known as the Young Persons magazine. It's primarily young writers, young single people, uh, or maybe they're dating but they don't have a family. It's people who just live different lives than the people who work at the Times in Fast Company. And so they have a different perspective on this whole remote work thing. And I think they actually nailed it more on the head than the big stuffy established newspapers and we're going to look over it and we're going to discuss why so and before we go too much farther let me put this on silent so that there's no chiming all right andres is back in the office oh sorry it's called why the return to office isn't working and it starts andres is back to the office three days a week and like many knowledge workers he's not happy about it he says that while he and other executive assistants at his boston law firm have been forced back the attorneys haven't been following the rules. That's partly because the rules don't quite make sense and people in all types of jobs are only coming in because they have to, not because there's a good reason to go in. Quote, people have adapted to remote work and truthfully, the firm has done a tremendous job at adapting in the pandemic. But I think it's more the returning to work that they're struggling on. He, like a number of other office workers, spoke with Recode anonymously to avoid getting in trouble with his employer. That's probably a good idea. Andres enjoys working from home and thinks he does a good job of it, and it allows him to escape a long commute that's, that has only gotten 45 minutes longer thanks to construction projects on his route. The majority of Americans don't work from home, but among those who do, there's a battle going on about where they'll work in the future. And it's not just people who enjoy remote work who are upset about the return to the office. Those who want to be remote are upset because they enjoyed working from home and don't understand why, after two years of doing good work there, they have to return to the office. And it's a question that should be asked, and in my opinion, it's one that's not been answered very well. People who couldn't wait to go back are not finding the same situation they enjoyed before the pandemic, with empty offices and fewer anemones. Those who said they prefer hybrid, 60% of office workers, are not always getting the interactions with colleagues they'd hoped for. Now, you might remember in the other article, one of the things that was touted was interactions with colleagues, which I push back on because I keep my social life and my work life separate. I'm not going around to the office coworkers and saying, how was the game this weekend or things like that. No offense. They're nice people. They're my coworkers. They're not my buddies. I'm going to keep a separate relationship. I have work to do. They have work to do. And some people like these because they don't have a life outside of work. Now... For those people, they said they want to go back to the office, and other articles are quick to point out that you do get more interactions. But what happens if you go to the office 
and you don't get the same interactions? What if it's very different because people have either left for another company that will allow them to work remote or maybe they are working remote on the days you come to the office? It's kind of weird, right? Let's continue. The reasons a return to the office isn't working out are numerous. Bosses and employees have different understandings of what the office is for, and after more than two years of working remotely, everyone has developed their own varied expectations about how best to spend their time. As more and more knowledge workers return to the office, their experience at work, their ability to focus, their stress levels, their level of satisfaction at work has deteriorated, which that seems bad for business, if you ask me. That's a liability for their employers, as the rates of job openings and quits are near record highs for professional and business services, according to Bureau of Labor Statistics data. There are, however, ways to make return to the office better, but those will require some deep soul searching about why employers want employees in the office and when they should let it go. (laughs) I'm sure we can do a crack at the Disney song, but let's continue. So here's the current situation as far as Vox sees it. For now, many employees are just noticing the hassle of the office, even if they're going in way less than they did pre-pandemic. This is what's known as the hybrid model, and even though people like the remote work aspect of it, for many it's still unclear what the office part is for. Quote, If I go into the office and there are people, but none of them are on my team, I don't gain anything besides a commute, Matthew, who works at a large payroll company in New Jersey, said. Instead of sitting at my own desk, I'm sitting at a desk in Roseland. Good point. Matthew's company is asking people to come in three days a week, but he says people are mostly showing up for two. Further complicating things is while the main reason hybrid workers cite for wanting to go into the office is to see colleagues, they also don't want to be told when to go in, according to Nicholas Bloom, a Stanford professor who, along with other academics, has been conducting a large ongoing study of remote workers called WFH Research. Employees say that management has yet to really penalize people for failing to follow office guidance, likely out of fear of of alienating a workforce in a climate where it's hard to hire and retain employees. Many others moving farther from the office during the pandemic makes the commute harder. The result is circular. People go into the office to see other people, but then don't actually see those people, so they stop going into the office as much. Now, it should be noted that, you know, what some managers can do at that point, if you don't show up for the office, they can fire you, but... Again, I've discussed in my previous video why just threatening to fire people doesn't work. I mean, we are in a situation where people have done the work from home. They've done it well. They've done it for a long time. And to ask them to change their habits, that's very, very difficult. Now, the funny thing is some people might say the same thing when the pandemic started and people were first forced to work from home. And people had to adjust to that. But the thing was, it was much easier to adjust to that because the... Uh, benefits were very, very clear. Oh, you just have to get up five minutes before you go to work? That's great. You can clock right on. Hey, if you're working and you decide you want to drink, get one of your own beverages. You don't have to drink a coffee that you don't like. You can get a buy if you want. And then, of course, when you got off work, well, shoot, there was no commute. You could either spend that time driving to go see a movie or to a theme park or, heck, maybe just stay in. Take a nap right afterwards. Like, it was just... There, the benefits were numerous and they were obvious, but going back to the office is not so obvious. And it ju- the managers are having a hard time explaining, yeah, we want you to come back to the office for interaction and stuff, but why? Especially if the people I'm going to be interacting with aren't even on my team. Let's continue. With 70% of office workers globally now back in the office at least one day a week, the excitement many people felt a few months ago is wearing off. For many, that novelty is turning into an existential question, why are we ever here? (laughs) Quote, it's sort of like the first day of school when you're back from summer vacation, and it's nice to see people and catch up with them, Brian Lomax, who works at the Department of Transportation in Washington, D.C., and who's expected to come in two days a week, said. But now it's, oh, hey, good to see you, and then you go about your day. An experience, he says, is the same as working from home and reaching out to people via Microsoft Teams. Most of the people we spoke to use software like Teams, Slack, and Zoom to communicate even while they're in the office, making the experience similar to home. If one person in a meeting is on a video call from home, say because they're immune compromised or they have a child care duties or just happens to be the day they work from home that week, everyone is... There's actually been an... Uh, okay, so this comment was weird, a little um, 
oddly, but I think it basically means like, well, if you go in to, you know, have your interactions with people, but one person is on a Zoom call meeting because they can't come into the office or they it's not their day, then everybody has to get on their Surface or iPad Pro and hop on that Zoom call. And then how is that really different from working at home except you've actually just driven there now? So there's actually been an uptick in virtual meetings despite the return to the office, according to Calendy. In April, 64% of meetings set up through the appointment scheduling software included video conferencing or phone calls compared with seven, sorry, with 48 a year earlier. One issue is that hybrid means different things from a company to company and even team to team. Typically, it seems employers are asking workers to come in a set number of days per week, usually two or three. Some employers are specifying which day, some are doing it by team, some are leaving it up to the individual workers. In fact, I'm going to say something right now. If you're leaving it up to the individual workers, that's when you really need to ask yourself, why are they coming into the office? Because at that point, it's like, there's no reason for them to be here. There's nothing they're scheduled to do. You just want them to come in two days a week and it's up to them. But then why are you making them do the dog and pony show in the first place? It just doesn't make sense. Almost half of office visits are just once a week, and over a third of these visits are for less than six hours, according to data from workplace occupancy analytics company Basking.io, as reported by Bloomberg. The middle of the week tends to be much busier than Mondays and Fridays when there are empty cubicles as far as the eye can see. There's also a disconnect between why employees think they're being called in. Employees cite their company's sunk real estate investments, their boss's need for control, and their metal manager's raison d'etre, or whatever, however you pronounce that, um, and I agree with that. But here's the thing. Employers, meanwhile, think going into the office is good for creativity, innovation, and cultural building. I want to write again. Pixar made Turning Red and Luca and Soul remotely, for the most part. So good luck making that argument. Nearly 80% of employees think that they've been just as or more productive than they were before the pandemic, while less than half of leaders think so, according to Microsoft Trends Index. You know, that's probably that situation where when they do polls and they find out where Americans rank on standardized testing, America ranks way down here. But in terms of confidence, Americans are higher than any other country in the world. So I think that's kind of interesting, and that probably makes sense. I mean, you know, the employees, they feel that they're more productive at home, but the employers don't necessarily think that. Now, one thing I would like to ask is, well, why don't the employers think that way? Are they actually looking at spreadsheets and seeing diminished returns on their productivity, or do they just feel like, eh, I'm not keeping an eye on them? They could just be playing cards all day, or Solitaire, or Pokemon Go, or whatever. I mean... I would like to have a follow-up, like, why do they feel that way? Employers and employees tend to agree that a good reason to go to the office is to see colleagues face-to-face -face and onboard new employees. I actually do agree that onboarding new employees is probably better to see them in the office. Data from Time is LTD found that employees that start during the pandemic are collaborating with less than 70% of colleagues and clients as their tenured peers would have been at this point. Slack's future form survey found that while executives were more likely to say people should come into the office full time, they are less likely to do so themselves. The nature of individuals' jobs also determines how much, if at all, they think they should be in the office. Melissa, a government policy analyst in D.C., is supposed to go in twice a week, but has only been going in once because she says her work involves collaborating with others, but not usually at the same time. She might write a draft, send it to others to read, and then they'll make comments and perhaps at some point they all get together to talk about it. Quote, I see a lot of these ads for these teamwork apps. They always show these pictures of people sitting at a conference table and they have paper and all sorts of things on the wall and they're really collaborating on products development or something, Melissa said. And I'm like, that's not what we're doing. Still, she thinks that's fr thinks that from manager's perspectives, in-person is the gold standard regardless of the actualities of the job. I kind of I kind of agree with that, to be perfectly honest. I mean, so, you know, we, we talk about, let me... Um, let, let me, uh, oh, she's going to add this. It feels like they just want people in the office, she said. And that's going to highlight my point just like a little bit better. So, uh, you know, we talk about credit cards on this channel sometimes. And by the way, there are more credit card videos coming for those who have asking. Yes, check in Monday. There will be another credit card review. But, you know, one of the golden standards of the credit cards has been the American Express Black Card or the Century, Century Card. This is the exclusive card. You have to be invited. You can charge a jet to it. And it's a symbol of status. 
But when we talk about credit cards, we talk about it from an entrepreneurial point of view. Like, what can the credit card rewards do for your business and how can you maximize them and use it so that you can reinvest into your business, you know, by just making everyday purchases. And when you look at the American Express Black Card, it kind of sucks. The annual fee is way too high. You don't get any... The, the points are very low. I mean, you can definitely spend a lot of money with it, but and you definitely and you have your own private concierge, and I guess that's nice. But they're not going to help you grow your business. They're going to help you get tickets to Hamilton or something like that. So I think that's kind of where it is. Even though the black card is the gold standard, I try to tell people try not to aim for that too much because really at the end of the day, the gold and the platinum cards, those are the things that are gonna help your business grow and those are what you can use to enhance your business and make it grow better and to help you invest more in your own life. But the black card just takes money from you. And yet we have this situation with remote work where for bosses, being in the office is the gold standard when really it's a drain on the company and the resources and the morale. They'd just be better off sending everyone at home, closing most of the office, keeping one room open for the CEO and a room open maybe for interviews, and just cutting their losses and saving a lot of money and making everyone much happier. Let's continue this. It also depends on the pace of work. A financing services employee at Wells Fargo in Iowa said he works more efficiently at the office, but that since his job consists of working on deals that come in sporadically throughout the day, that efficiency means he ends up wasting a lot of time playing on his phone or pacing around in the office between. Yeah, that's one thing I definitely liked about working from home is if it was really, really slow and there was just nothing to do, I could take an extra break, I could walk around the, the house, I could do some push-ups, I could make some lunch, I could do a little bit of writing for my YouTube channel and my iCritic vlog, but to just be in the office and to just be like, this is an iPod, but just like, like, it's not, that's wasting everyone's time and money. Employers are certainly feeling the frustration from their employees and have been walking back how much they're asking employees to be in the office. Last summer, office workers reported that their employers would allow them to work from home 1.26 days a week, 1.2, not even two days, just 1.26 a day. Now that's gone up 2.3 days. Wow, you just can't make it three, huh? So here's the average days per week employees will be allowed to work from home post COVID. Um, I guess it's going up. Companies are rolling back return to office or RTO plans at law firms, insurance agencies, and everywhere in between. Even financing companies like JP Morgan Chase, whose CEO has been especially vocal about asking people to return to their offices, have loosened up. Tech co companies have long been at the forefront when it comes to allowing hybrid or remote work, and now even more tempany companies, including Airbnb, Cisco, and Twitter, are joining the club. Even Apple, which has been much stricter than its peers in coexing employees, to go back to the office has paused its plan to increase days in the office to three a week after employee pushback and the resignation of a prominent machine learning engineer. It seems for now, office workers have the upper hand. Many don't expect to be penalized by management for not working from the office when they're supposed to, partly because they don't think management believes in the rules themselves. Quote, our retention is better than expected and our employee engagement is better than expected, so I don't think our executives are seeing any downside, said Rob Carr, who works at an insurance company in Columbus, Ohio, where he, where people are expected to be in three days a week, but as far as he's seen, rarely go. Honestly, if they were, I think they'd be cracking down and they're not. So, for all we know, maybe part of this you have to be in the office is all show. Carr himself goes into the office every day, but only because he and his wife downsized houses and moved a short bike ride from his office. Otherwise, Gar, Gar is a car, is a car, Gar, I'm going to say car, who is on the autism spectrum and says he doesn't do well with in-person interactions, would be completely happy working from home as he is from his empty office. And I'm on the spectrum, so you know why I don't like to <laughs> work with people. Hats off to Apple for innovation, Carr said, but they are certainly, from a Silicon Valley perspective, an old company. So, now we get to the big question. What to do about the broken return to the office? Well, solving the office conundrum is not easy, and in all likelihood, it will be impossible to make everyone happy. But it's important to remember that going to the office never really worked for everyone. It was just what everyone did. Now, two years after the pandemic sent office workers to their living rooms, their employers may have a chance to make people more happy than before. The problem, quote, the problem is right now you've set something that's unrealistic and doesn't work. And when employees try it out and it doesn't work, they give up. 
If employees refuse to come in, it means the system isn't working. To fix that, employers should explore not only why they want people in the office, but whether bringing people into the office is achieving those goals. If the main reason to bring people back is to collaborate with colleagues, for example, they need to set terms that ensure that happens. That could mean people making people who should be working together come in on the same days, a problem around which a whole cottage industry of remote scheduling software has cropped up. That said, Bloom believes there's no golden rule of how often it's necessary to go in to get the benefits of the office. Importantly, when workers do come in, they shouldn't be bogged down with anything they could be doing at home. F first, figure out how many days a week or a month constructively would be good to have people face to face. And that depends on how much time you spend on activities that are best in person. He said, referring to things like onboarding, training and socializing. Employers need to be realistic about how much in-person work really needs to happen. Rather than making people come in a few times a week at random, where colleagues pass like ships in the night, they could all come in on the same day of the week, or even once a month or quarter, and on those days, the perks of coming in have to be more than tacos and t-shirts too. While fun, free food, and swag aren't actually good reasons to go into the office, how much someone needs to come to the office might also vary by team or job type. Quote, for me, coming in to do teaching and to go to research seminars, that might be twice a week, Bloom said. But for other people, like coders, it may just be a big coding meeting and a few trainings once a month. For people in marketing and advertising, Mad Men, that's very much around meetings, discussions, problem solving. That may be two or three days. Another thing to consider, especially for those who truly like the office, is how they can get an experience with fewer of the downsides. Currently, even employees who still like their offices are a lot aren't necessarily using them. Real estate service company JLL found that about a third of the offices are workers are using are so-called third places like cafes and co-worker spaces to work, even when they have offices they can go to. Matt Burkett, who leads a team of 30 at Flattergan Health, is one of those workers. He says he works better in office than at home where he has two young children. And while Burkhard enjoys going into the office and goes there once or twice per week, though he won't be required to do so until later this summer, the trips to Manhattan isn't always feasible, especially if he has to do childcare for part of the day, and he's been going to Daybase, a co-working space near his home in Hoboken, New Jersey, three or four times per week. I'm just a lot more focused when everyone is in the same place working, Burkhardt said, noting that he hasn't asked his company to pay for the $50 a month membership fee. <laughs> Probably a good thing. For many office workers, the current state of affairs just isn't working out, so they're doing what they can to make their experience of work better, whether that means renting co-working space or not showing up for the arbitrary in-office days. They don't necessarily hate the office. What they hate is not having a good reason to be there, and that is really the big thing that's going on. For every company that says you have to be in the office, the big question is why? I remember that there was a headline, and I didn't talk about it then, but I'm talking about it now, where on the day that J.P. Morgan forced all of their employees to come back into the office, employees went to the office to find that the upper management were still working remotely. And what were they doing? What were these employees doing in the office that they couldn't do at home? Why they were having meetings over Zoom? Unfrickin' believable. And that's what's made me very, very unhappy about all of this, especially when it comes to like my wife. My wife loves working at home, does not want to go back in the office. She's actually kind of scared to get a new job because uh, not that she's looking, but, you know, she would not want to work at a place where the office makes where they make her come into the office. So, you know, she's sticking around with this job because this works for her. But. You know, there's a lot of employees, and I know some friends who actually moved out of town. They were doing their work just fine from another state. And then the boss said, hey, you got to come back to the office. They're like, well, we moved. Like, you moved? What gave you the right to move? It's like, well, we're working remote. It's like, well, we need you to come back and move back. It's like, well, what am I doing in the office that I can't do here? And, and that's what's not being addressed. You know, if you can give a reason to bring people into the office, then by all means, do it and some jobs you just might need to do this but you know i'm an accountant i do spreadsheets most of the time i you know i get into google docs and i punch in receipts and i do calculations and i don't need to be in an office for that i'd much rather put my headphones on and do it at home in my pajamas if possible and it just amazes me that you know, these bosses don't understand that there is no reason for me to put on 
a suit and to drive 40 minutes away and waste I don't know how many dollars in gas by the time this video goes up to sit in the office and do something that I could do taking five steps away from my kitchen. There's just no reason to do it. And I'm glad that Vox and some of these publications are pushing back on some of the old timer um, newspapers and online um, publications for basically saying, you know what, there's more to this story than what the employers want. The employers don't even do the work. Have you ever noticed that the worst uh, managers out there are the ones who think they know everything, but they really know nothing? I kind of feel like that's what's going on with this whole work from home argument. The employers are saying things are better from here. Things are better when you're in the office. You don't work as well when you work from home. And the employees are sitting here going like, uh, excuse me, do you do what I do? Have you ever done what I do? How do you know? And I think that's a fair question to be asking them. And they're doing a very, very good job of holding the line and basically not putting up with it. Now, what work from home is going to look like in the future? I don't know. I mean, I'm not totally opposed to a hybrid schedule, but, you know, even the hybrid model is going to fall apart if people start coming in on days that they find they don't really need to be going in. And then at that point, it's just an extra thing to do. But anyway, that's my video. Those are my comments. I think anyone who has not embraced work from home is a dinosaur. In fact, I'm going to throw one more thing out there. One more thing. You know how we're having like a housing crisis right now and like a rental crisis? I wonder what would happen if a lot of these big companies gave up their fancy offices. And I've kind of touched on this before, but it's like, hey, we're going to keep just a few rooms for ourselves. We're going to turn you know, put the rest of these offices, they're all going to become like um, affordable housing or something. Could we like start putting a dent in the homeless population? Could we start, you know, giving these employees like a reason to actually move in? Like, I just wonder, like there's so much office space not being used right now. And if no one wants to use it, why are we letting these egotistical managers at big tech companies and stuff having that office space say hey sell us this much office space back we're going to turn it into living quarters and start getting this out of control rent under control so anyway just another thought comment below like favorite share subscribe and as always flame responsibly have a good one